Now I'm gonna bring on Scott, and you probably know him already because Scott just had this like uh, meteoric rise. But all right, here goes Scott's background. Graduated from John Hopkins University in 2007 and took an unpaid internship. You know, we're finding a lot of commonalities here. Um, at The Onion so he can get his foot in the door in the industry, uh, performed stand-up comedy and made funny YouTube videos throughout his internship uh, and a photo editor at The Onion who spearheaded content development for HQ Trivia. That's where you know him from, I'm sure. Uh, later on, uh, thought of Scott for his host position. When Scott went on to HQ Trivia, uh, an app-based game show in which participants uh, could win big cash prizes, uh, it became very popular. So the game became popular, and uh, he was invited to visit the owner's suite at the Super Bowl in 2018. But after attracting 2.4 million players, the app faded in popularity. Currently, Scott hosts uh, It's So Late Night, a 45-minute live stream comedy show where he jokes with and interviews uh, self-isolated celebrities like myself. My interview was in May. And he also started selling his large collection of vintage T-shirts on Instagram, Quiz Daddy's Closet uh, to raise money for charities like City Meals on Wheels. Uh, I'm bring Scott on right now. What's up, Scott? How you doing, man? Hey, man. I'm all right. How you doing? It is good to see you. I am great. Where are you at right now? I am, uh, I actually headed up to the old homestead. My old roommates, uh, mom and dad, I'm, I'm back with them just for, just for a couple of days. They're helping out around the house. You know, they're in their 70s. They need some help when it comes to... Uh, this pandemic and, yeah. and my sisters across the ocean. She's in Scotland with her husband, so it's just me over here. So I'm doing the, the, the good son thing right now. That's what you should do. That's what you should do. Yeah. Thank God. Thank God. So, man, it's good to see you. Listen, I'm going to hop right into it. I know we were running a little late, and thank you for your patience and your time. So um, let's, why, don't we, why don't we talk about right now, you know, you started as an intern. I, you were just talking to JR, and, um, you know, he started as an intern. And t tell me about why – now, did you do the intern for credit for college credit alone, or just tell me a little bit about that? Because a lot of people think they got to get paid no matter where they go. I was out of college at that point, but before I get into that, I just want to shout out to Jr. here because you know the universe works in mysterious ways. Then Jr. was talking about his journey, how he's been hustling and, and grinding since day one. I have an email from Jr. October two thousand nine. He came to my very first group of sports talk shows I was doing called 12 Angry Mascots back in 2009. And he was a scrappy young kid who's like, hey, I want to come out and cover your show for my blog. I'm like, sure, come on out. Nice. He comes, he does a video with Darrell Reeves from the Jets. It gets like 10,000 views. So I, I have emails with him from 2009, 2010. And, and, and to see him 10 years later, after all that work, blowing up the way he is, I, I just hats off to JR, man. He's, I'm telling you, I've seen that journey since day one. And I'm so proud of him. And and it's such an inspiration. You know, my, myself and I look at myself the same way. We, I was a nobody comedian at the time, just doing my own thing, being a self-starter. I was doing the internship in 2008. That was after I graduated college. So I was not getting paid there, doing other side gigs to pay rent while I was doing the internship. But, you know, getting back to that, it's, it's the networking effect that you talk about. You mentioned in my intro, Nick Gallo at The Onion. I met him in 2008. Ten years later, he's calling me up and saying, hey, you want to come in audition for this uh, HQ thing? So had I not met him and maintained that friendship back then, you know, we stayed friends on Facebook. We go to parties together. You know, we, we, we were actually, you know, we stayed in touch. But you don't even have to be that in touch. If you just are a nice person, a good person, and you make those connections in your early career, 5, 10, 15, 20 years later, you never know when those connections are going to come back and help you out. And that's exactly what happened with Nick. That so, same thing happened with us. You yeah. and I, because of, because of our buddy Zach, uh, he said, hey, you know, somebody wants to do a spoof on Shark Tank. This was about 10 years ago. I said, all right, no problem. And, you know, you were there and we, we did our thing. And then all of a sudden, I think six or six years or seven years passed, you know, your, your trivia shows out and, you know, and, and, and everything. And we're all talking. And, and you're right. I mean, I see people on Shark Tank that I saw – 10 years ago, and they didn't even have the product they were on Shark Tank with. They had something else. And they're like, oh, remember me? I was in a pitch competition, and you were, you, you know, you gave me five stars on my pitch, you know, a public pitch competition, and that business failed, or I, I left this partner, or whatever happened, and now I got something new, and I don't even remember them when they're pitching, but afterwards, I'll go, 
oh wow, because they're pitching a whole nother product. But I'll see that you'll see the same people like on the grind for like 10, 15 years and you'll turn around and go, oh, this person didn't come out of nowhere. They've been busting their ass for all these years. And look, it's, it's, I, I, people ask me all the time, you know, how do I get into comedy? What should I do? And I feel like a lot of people just want that instant success. And no matter what field they're in, whether you're a writer, I mean, that's probably the hardest thing because, you know, when you're in the, when you're in the creative arts and you're an artist, a painter, a writer, you know, you're putting your, your brain out there into the page or to the canvas, it's going to take a long time. Most, most of the time, it takes a long time for you to build up that social capital and to get people to recognize, oh, this guy has, or this guy or girl has some talent, some genius here, if you actually have that talent and genius. I mean, look, some people put it out there and it's just, it's not that good and you're not gonna get, all right, try something else, you know? Not, yeah. everything isn't for everyone. But Yeah, you won't, you won't know it's not that good until you put it out. Exactly, you gotta put it out. JR, look, how many sports fans out there? Tens of millions, right? Yeah, but yeah. But do what JR's doing? Not too many, because he went out there and did it. And, and well, let's prove that he's got the talent for it. Well, let's get to you. I mean, one day, um, you know, I think season two, um, Jeff Foxworthy was a fellow shark, and we were sitting on set, and he was telling me, uh, he was like, you know, listen, um, uh, you know, Rihanna, Chris Brown, Michael Jackson, whoever, or Madonna can go out. Madonna can go out and sing Material Girl for the rest of her life, right? Yeah. And you go to her concert or whatever, you're waiting for Material Girl to come on sooner or later, right? I mean, or like a virgin or whatever it is. He said, in comedy, I can't tell the same joke twice. You yeah. know, after I, after I have this, you know, this show, whatever the case is, I can't tell the same dope joke twice. And he said, you got to earn every single snicker or laugh in that room, whether it's two people or it's a thousand. And I want people to think about right or, or, or a million. I want people to think about right now walking into a room, into a dinner party, and everybody's like this. And you have to stand there and you have to tell joke after joke after joke. And no matter how much they respond or how other they, they have to pivot against the responses, against the boos, or how hard is that shit? Well, man, it, it's, uh, I would say fighting fire is a little harder. You know, there's certain things. <laughs> People say, oh, you're so brave to be a comedian, you know. Going off to war is brave. I mean, what we're doing at the end of the day, it's, it's, there's a buffet happening over the side. Maybe you're contending with the bar, being too loud, shaking the cocktails. But other than that, you're not really up against too much. You are up against, your, you know, really yourself. And it's about, look, life is all about overcoming fear, finding the confidence, right? I mean, if all of us could find that confidence, we'd all be walking around millionaires, successful in every, every field. I feel like a lot of people, they get stuck in, in, in maybe hitting that rut or hitting their head against the walls because they can't break past that fear and break past, you know, the shackles that are saying, you're not good enough. You can't go up there and do that. And, you're, and people are being held, held down and tied down by their own brain. It's their own mental power. Yeah, you know what? Let me ask you something. Have you ever got booed? Of course. What do you mean, of course? I thought you were going to think about it. So you can have your own mental power all you want. I, I did a but show you to... see somebody up on stage going, yeah, and you're up on stage and you see somebody going, boo, get out of here. And you're trying to do what you've already rehearsed a couple of hours or a couple of minutes. How do you say, no, you're, you're only against yourself? You're against a drunk asshole booing you right now. Well, sometimes if you have a drunk asshole, you know, you can use your jujitsu to come back at them and, and cut them down a peg. You know what I mean? <laughs> Why don't you pull down your pants and hit your right out of here, pal? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but but, but there, there are certain lines. You, but I'll tell you one story. You know, I haven't been doing a lot of, of live comedy lately <coughs> because, of course, no one's doing any live comedy lately. But I did do a rooftop show just two nights ago, and that was a great crowd. I told them, you guys better laugh tonight because I'm standing pretty close to the edge of this roof. <laughs> I, might, <laughs> I might just jump. But I, I did a show maybe last year, two years ago. It was at a strip club, kind of burlesque club kind of thing. So I was going on in the midst of all these burlesque acts, kind of using there's a, a stripper pole in the middle. And, and right before I'm going on, some woman's up there doing her thing, twisting around. And, I, and, you know, the crowd's all about that, right? Very positive, sex positive crowd and everything. And I think they were probably there more for the burlesque than the comedy, to be honest. I go out there. And I make a joke about, you know, this is before the pandemic. I go, 
how much Purell can we get in this poll right now? Can we wipe this thing down? Like, I'm not making fun, <laughs> fun of the, of, of, of the, you know, the stripper kind of thing. And I called him a stripper. God, God forbid you call them a stripper. The place went nuts. Boom! These are dancers. This is burlesque. This is art. So, right. So, so you know, yeah, you, you, have to, you have to deal with that a little bit. And that, that set didn't go too well. But at the end of the day, Damon, what you got to remember is you have a bad night like that, you can get back up and do it tomorrow. You can even get back up on stage that same night. You can go out three, four times a night. If you live in a city like New York, where you have opportunities to perform two, three, four times a night even, you can actually just get right back up there, back on the horse after you fall off. So that's do you ever, do you ever, do you ever, are you the kind of person or a, a comedian that makes fun of yourself? Or because I find, you know, my, my boy, uh, he showed me a video of this guy. The guy has, uh, I think, cerebral palsy. I'm not sure what's his then you may know the comedian, what's his challenge with walking, but he has the two sticks and, you know, he yeah. walks like that. Yeah. And he's a comedian. Josh and Blue. he take, I think so. And he takes like five minutes to get on stage. You ever seen this guy? Yeah. And when he gets up on stage, if people aren't clapping a lot, he goes, did you see how much it took for me to get on stage? And he, and he talks like, mm -hmm, and he goes, I'm going to do it again. And he takes like five minutes to get back off and five minutes to get back on. And people are just dying laughing, and he's in on the joke, obviously. Of course, I mean, are of you in? Are you, do you do that as well? Because what I'm trying to come at forget, uh, is, 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 is when people are, are broadcasting or people are doing presentations, how much humbling should they do themselves so it takes that negativity out of the room? I look at it as, uh, you know, when you get on stage in front of someone, automatically – you're elevating yourself above them, right? Just by the pure physics of it. You're on a stage, the stage is higher up, you've got a microphone, your voice is being amplified. The audience, it depends. Some, some audience members are, 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 are more than thrilled to be an audience member. Oh, I can't wait, I love being. But some people in the audience, they get almost affronted by it. It's like, you think you're better than me? Yeah. You're up there on that stage, you've got your voice, I've got a voice. You know, so for those types of people in the audience, and I would say for everyone, you want to, I, I look at it this way, but some, some comedians don't do this, but my, my personality is very self you know, deprecating. I want to almost cut myself down to the same size as the audience and say, Hey, we're all, we're all the same here. We're all in the same playing field here. So you throw some of those jokes out there. And if, if you have cerebral palsy, you know, you talk about it. If you're seven feet tall, you mention that if you're 5,000 pounds, you mentioned, I mean, you know, if there are things about your appearance, because again, people are judging you right on your looks when you walk out there. What's this guy gonna talk about? What's this person all about? So if you address those things with me, it's like, look, I get it. This is almost too much Judaism for one face. Like, let's turn it down <laughs> a little bit. Right? <laughs> but, but you know, you, so you kind of throw that out there and, 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 and if you get people laughing at you, I think that kind of brings everyone kind of in this safe space together. Now you can say, hey, I'm just one of you. We're gonna have a good time tonight. And then you can start talking about whatever you want. And it also helps when, if you're going to talk about divisive issues, you know, get political or whatever, you know, you want to sort of say, hey, we're all human at the beginning here. Let's start from a place of humanity. And then we can disagree on certain things, but I'm going to give you my point of view. I have the mic. I am the one being paid to be here. So, <laughs> you know, listen to me for tonight. And if you want to talk to me after the show, we can talk. Well, listen to you. So, so when I first started speaking, it took me a couple of years to get this, and I'll, I'll tell you my response to it, but how can people relate to this is that, you know, you'll see people sleeping in the crowd. And I've also seen, you know, you'll often see people get up and just walk out. And I used to say, damn, what did I say so bad? You know, like, or, or damn, I'm, I'm that whack or whatever the case is. And I started to realize that I shouldn't take it personal because they may have to go out. They may have to get up because they had to go to the bathroom or they had to call their daughter or it was time for them to leave because they wanted to be there for an hour, but they can only be there half an hour. And now we're seeing it on the Zooms and the Skypes when you're on these big calls and half the people are turning their screens off. Or you see them clearly emailing and texting on their phone, or maybe they're playing a game like a Monopoly, like sometimes I actually do on some Zoom calls, right? <laughs> How do you not let that get to you and not feel like what I'm saying is not of value to this person? You know what I mean? How do you, how do you let that not get to you, if, if at all? I mean, because my thing was just, I realized that I assumed that no matter what, something was really important, like their daughter or their their wife or they had to leave or they had they had to go to the bathroom because I if I take it any other way I'm going to overanalyze the thing and then it's going to it's going to affect what I'm presenting to the rest of the people who are actually listening 
Yeah, I go the other way. I just assume that they are, are they have evil in their heart. They are terrible people, and they're going <laughs> to hell. And they are they can't be saved. And no, <laughs> I uh, look when, when you come to these events, when you when you when you speak in front of a room of three hundred people or whatever it is, you just have to know you're not the pope. You know, everyone's not sitting there raptured in your presence. Okay, the people who booked you, they're fans of yours. But most of those people, some of them, if they're not like paying members for coming to you, I'm going to pay thirty dollars to see Damon John speak. I'm going to, you know, if they're not coming for you and they're not invested in that, well, not everyone may not be, you know, paying attention all the time. And you have to just accept the fact that some people maybe were brought here against their will. Some people, you know, some some boyfriend dragged their girlfriend along. Some girlfriend dragged their boyfriend. Whatever it is, that's a good point. You just go. I'm here for the people who want to see me. And if if you're one of the few people who don't know who I am or don't care for my stuff, I'm not here for you. Look, uh, you know, Disney movies aren't, aren't for, you know, um, you know, tw 28 year olds most of the time. You know, you know kids movies are not for adults. I mean, like certain things are for certain people sometimes. And I'm not for everyone. I like to say I'm not for anyone. <laughs> right. But, but everyone has their fan base, their niche, and you cultivate that and you can't worry about it. You're not to get everyone on board with you. Like The Onion. I always thought about this. You know, you mentioned The Onion, the, 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 the paper I, I uh, interned for and I got to write for, uh, fortunately. I think The Onion is some of the best comedy going today. I mean, certainly 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, the best written comedy out there. But, you know, their circulation was maybe a couple hundred thousand, right? Like, they weren't reaching 300 million people. A lot of people would read The Onion headlines and think that was the real news. They didn't even get the joke that right. The Onion was trying to tell them. So for those people, if you're reading The Onion and you don't realize it's a joke, I'm sorry, you're never going to understand The Onion. It's just not for you. Right. But The Onion, to me, had like a ceiling. There's only a certain amount of people who are ever going to re really appreciate and understand this, this publication. And that goes for everyone and everything. Not everyone's going to love Damon John. Not everyone's going to love Sky Regatta. Not everyone's going to love you. Accept it. And move on. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Well... So, so what are you doing now again? Where can people find you right now? Obviously, I put up your IG, and I want to know because I know you got a lot of different content going out. And you, uh, where can people find you right now besides IG, or that's just the main place? You can find me in my parents' house right now. Uh, <laughs> you know, IG. Yeah, I kind of I've, I've been sort of taking a break from social media, man. This pandemic, I, you know, I, 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 you know, I will echo what everyone is saying. The whole uh, beyond the pandemic, the, the 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 social justice movement that's been picking up this summer. I basically, after we recorded our show, I think you might have been one of my last guests, Damon. I sort of took a step back. A, I wanted to give space to other voices out there and other creators that wanted, I wanted to take some time off away from all that and, you know, educate myself further and get more on, on, on the level of what's going on and be part of the movement, go out in the streets, you know, reading James Baldwin, you know, you know getting, really getting into all this. And, um, so I'm still, frankly, kind of in that mode right now. I'm reading uh, Eddie Glaude's book, uh, Born Again, about James Baldwin right now. And, and I'm reading, you know, I, I read, uh, So You Want to Talk About Race, Il Giomo Luo. And I'm just like reading, I'm watching. I'm kind of sitting back and creating less right now uh, to, to sort of recharge my, my, my spiritual self a little bit and, and to be, you know, that universal consciousness we're trying to reach. I think that's kind of the most important thing. But I am maintaining my internet presence specifically for my t-shirt uh, business, Quiz Daddy's Closet on Instagram. And I'm using the money that I raised there to donate to various causes. I've raised over $20,000 for charity so far. they are giving a lot to Black Lives Matter causes. I've been supporting a bookstore in the Bronx called The Lit. I bought 250 copies of So You Want to Talk About Race. And now I'm sending those copies about, of books out to people who want one. So if you find me on Twitter, find, DM me right now. If you want to read this book, you can't afford it. I'll send you a copy free of charge. If you have a school, I sent 30 copies to a school teacher in, in Southern New Jersey. She's going to give it to her students and have like a whole teaching course around it. So I'm trying to, you know, support black owned bookstores, get these books and this knowledge into the hands of people who need it, who can't afford it. And um, that's kind of where I'm, where I'm at these days. That's where you need to leave it because that is absolutely amazing. So I really appreciate you, Scott, man. Thank you for what you're doing. And thank you for, uh, for uh, making us laugh, but also making us think right now. Appreciate you, man. All right, you got it, brother.